guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering multiple sclerosis. I'm going to be covering myasthenia gravis, and I'm going to be covering Guillain-Barre syndrome. So guys, if you haven't done so already, you know what I'm about to ask you to do. Please like and subscribe below. Please don't forget, guys, I have audio lessons that are now available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. If you're struggling on a particular subject, hit my website. I break things down for you. I explain it. And most importantly, I point out to you what you are most likely going to be seeing on your test, guys. I've been doing this for years. I know what I'm talking about. Please don't forget, I'm also on TikTok and Instagram now. My social, um, my my handle on social media, all the social media platforms is the same, Nexus Nursing. And I also have a podcast out. Um, I have four podcasts out uh, each week on Sundays, 1 p.m., just like I do on YouTube. Um, my information is released. So on my podcast, which you can find on uh, Spotify, um, Google Podcasts, I'm like on 12 or 13 pot platforms, Nexus Nursing, I have a podcast for LPN and RN students, and I also have a podcast for nurse practitioner students. And the one for nurse practitioner students, I actually cover the content that you'll most likely see on your state board exam, regardless of the state that you're testing out of. So if you know someone that's a student or new or recent graduate of the nurse practitioner program, have them check out my podcast. I have something for everyone. Okay guys, so without any further ado, let's get started. The nurse is assessing a 48-year-old client diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Which clinical manifestation assessed by the nurse would warrant immediate intervention? One, the client has scanning speech and diplopia. Two, the client has dysarthria and scotomas. Three, the client has muscle weakness and spasticity. Four, the client has a congested cough and dyspnea. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is four. The client has congested cough and dyspnea or dyspnea. That's how some people pronounce it. Anyway, why is this the answer? Because this is what's most life-threatening. People with uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, they very often have, uh, they aspirate and they end up having pneumonia. And guys, this has a life-threatening consequences. So the fact that the patient has a cough and dyspnea, that's who we're going to run to first to assess them, okay? Now, choices one, two, and three, the, uh, the scanning speech, the double vision, the dysarthria, the scotomas, the muscle weakness, the spasticity, all of these are signs and symptoms that we see in uh, multiple sclerosis, absolutely, but they're not life-threatening like that cough and that dyspnea, dyspnea is. Why? Because we're worried about what? Aspiration, okay? So that's why number four is the reason we'd be running to the patient versus the other choices. Remember guys, whenever you get a question about who's going to be a priority, um, which patient would you intervene first? You always need to think of physiological integrity. What's going to kill the patient the fastest and what's going to keep them alive the longest, okay? Question number two. The client newly diagnosed with MS states, I don't understand how I got multiple sclerosis. Is it genetic? The nurse's response should be based on which scientific rationale. One, genetics may play a role in susceptibility to MS, but the disease may be caused by a virus. Two, there's no evidence that suggests there's any chromosomal involvement in developing MS. Three, MS is caused by a genetically recessive gene, so both parents had to have the gene for the client to get MS. Or four, MS is caused by an autosomal dominant gene on the Y chromosome, so only fathers can pass it on. And guys, the correct answer is one, genetics may play a role in susceptibility to MS, but the disease may be caused by a virus. And guys, the truth is, we just don't know. And that's the honest truth. Now, based on research and based on studies, we, we, we suspect that um, genetics are involved and that it has something to do with a recent viral infection, specifically either a respiratory infection or a GI infection, because we find that many patients who are diagnosed with MS, they just recently did have a respiratory GI infection, and many of them have a, a, a relative, okay? So we don't know 100%, but uh, research has shown a very close correlation to both genetics and post-infection, okay? 
when I say, <coughs> excuse me, guys, when I say post-infection, um, I'm speaking viral infection. All right. Next question. The 30-year-old female client is admitted with complaints of numbness, tingling, or crawling sensation affecting the extremities and double vision. During the interview, the client tells the nurse that she's been admitted twice before this twice before for the same complaints, but nothing was found and the symptoms went away on their own. Which question would be important for the nurse to ask the client? One, have you experienced any difficulty with your menstrual cycle? Two, have you noticed a rash across the bridge of your nose? Three, do you get tired easily and sometimes have problems swallowing? Or four, are you taking birth control pills to prevent conception? And guys, the correct answer is three. Do you get tired easily and have, uh, and sometimes have problems swallowing? Well, in the first question, I kind of gave you the answer where I told you many of these patients, they end up what? Aspirating. They end up getting pneumonia. So let's go back to the question. Let's look at the signs and symptoms that they gave us in the question to lead us to what the right answer is. Numbness, tingling, crawling sensation across the extremities, double vision, ding, 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 double vision. And here's the last one. Uh, patient had complaints about this before, but the symptoms went away on their own. You should be suspecting multiple sclerosis. So you're gonna ask them three, do you get tired easily and sometimes have trouble swallowing? Why? Fatigue, dysphagia, guys, these are common symptoms that we see in multiple sclerosis. And since we suspect multiple sclerosis, that's what we're gonna ask them. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, have you experienced any difficulty with your menstrual cycle? That has nothing at all to do with MS. Two, have you noticed a rash across the bridge of your nose? What's that? What would you be thinking? Lupus. Um, choice four, are you taking uh, birth control pills to prevent uh, conception? And that, again, has nothing to do with MS. So the correct answer is three, because fatigue and dysphagia are very, very common clinical manifestations of multiple sclerosis. The nurse enters the room of a client with acute exacerbation of multiple sclerosis and finds the cr client crying. Which statement would be most therapeutic response for the nurse to make? One, why are you crying? The medication will help the disease. Two, you seem upset. I'll sit down and we can talk for a while. Three, MS is a disease that has good times and bad times. Four, I will have the chaplain come and stay with you for a while. If you've been following me for any amount of time, you guys hands down already know what this answer is. The correct answer is two. If you seem upset, I'll sit down and we can talk for a while. This is the most therapeutic response. Number one, you seem upset. That's an observation and it's therapeutic. You just state your observation and the patient say, yes, I'm very upset. Or they'll be sarcastic and say, oh no, I'm having a good time. This feels like Disneyland. Either way, they're communicating, okay? So you made an observation and then look what it says next. It says, I will sit down and we can talk for a while. The fact that you're sitting down with the patient, that's called offering self. You're giving value to the patient. You're saying to the patient that you're valuable, you're worth my time and I'm gonna sit down to hear you out. Okay, that is the most therapeutic response. Number one's wrong because of that first word. We never, ever, ever say why or what made you. When you say that to a patient, you throw them on the defensive and that will totally shut them down. They're not going to want to talk to you. So number one's wrong. Number three, multiple sclerosis is, is a disease that has good times and bad times. And although that may be true because uh, the patient can go through remission, did the patient ask you about that? No, you came in the room and you saw they were upset. You want to say something or do something to promote communication and to promote the patient to um, explore their feelings and to describe their feelings and get their emotions out. Choice number four, I'll have the chaplain come stay with you for a while. What did I tell you about passing the buck? Do we pass the buck in nursing? No, we don't. So that's the wrong answer. You're going to choose number two. The client diagnosed with multiple sclerosis is scheduled for an MRI of the head. Which information should the nurse teach a client about the test? One, the client will have wires attached to the scalp and lights will flash off and on. Two, the machine will be loud and the client must not move the head during the test. Three, the client will drink a contrast medium 30 minutes to one hour before the test. Or four, the test will be repeated at intervals during a five to six hour period. 
And guys, the correct answer is two. The machine will be loud and the client will not, must not move the head during the test. So guys, the MRI, you have to warn them in advance. They're going to hear a loud ticking sound. Tick is not the word I'm looking. Banging, like a loud banging sound. And it's going to be a rhythmic banging sound. You have to let them know that in advance or it will freak them out. You have to let them know that they're going to have to stay still. You have to let them know that it's, it's going to be an enclosed space in case they're claustrophobic. You have to tell that patient that in advance. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, the client will have wires attached to the scalp. Lights will flash on and off. That's an EEG. That is not an MRI. Three, the contrast medium. That's for a CT scan, not an MRI. Uh, four, uh, the test will be repeated at intervals five to six hour period. No, it's only the MRI is done only one at a time. Okay. And usually the most you'll do it with the MRI is twice and not even that because usually when the MRI is done once, we get the information that we need. The only time we usually see them doing a second or third is if we're trying to see the extent of something. Okay. So the correct answer is number two. The 45-year-old client's diagnosed with primary progressive MS and the nurse writes a nursing diagnosis, anticipatory grieving related to progressive loss. Which intervention should be implemented? One, consult the physical therapist for assistive devices for mobility. Two, as a dietitian to provide thickening on each tray. Three, teach the client self-catheterization and bowel management. Four, discuss the client's wishes regarding end-of-life care. And guys, the correct answer is four. Discuss the client's wishes regarding end of life care. Go back to the question. What is a key word to let you know that number four is the answer? Progressive. What does progressive mean? As time goes on, it only gets worse. Alzheimer's is a progressive disease. As time goes on, it only gets worse. Okay? So the fact that this is progressive, you want to allow that patient an opportunity to make decisions for themselves when they cannot speak or cannot uh, communicate what they want to happen for themselves. You're giving them a chance to do it now in advance. You're giving them a chance to make the decision of how they want to die. So number four is the correct answer. Which assessment data would the nurse assess and the client diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome? One, an exaggerated startle reflex and memory changes. Two, cogwheel rigidity and inability to initiate voluntary movement. Three, sudden severe unilateral facial pain and inability to chew. Or four, progressive ascending paralysis of the lower extremities and numbness. And guys, the correct answer is four, progressive ascending paralysis of the lower extremities and numbness. This is Gillian Beret. This is what actually one of the distinctive features of Gillian Beret is that uh, the, the paralysis starts at the bottom, not at the top. It's not descending. This is an ascending disorder. So the paralysis of extremity starts on the bottom and it moves its way up. Now, before I go any further, I want to say to you, excuse me, that um, for many of the, the patient, these patients, it goes away. But the problem is we hope that it goes away before the paralysis hits the muscles of the lungs, because if it does, obviously that patient is going to have to be on a vent, right? So uh, something very important for you to know about Guillain-Barre is paralysis of those muscles, and it starts at the lower extremities and moves its way up. And here's the crazy thing. When it goes away, it goes away in the opposite order. It goes away from the last place it was and moves its way back down. So even though the lower extremities are the first to be affected, they're going to be the last to be resolve when the issue goes away. Okay. Which statement by the client supports the diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome? One, I just returned from a short trip. Two, I had a really bad cold just a few weeks ago. Three, I think one of the people I work with had this or four, I've been taking some herbs for more than a year. And guys, the correct answer is two. I had a really bad cold just a few weeks ago. And this is a famous nursing test question. It's definitely on Hesse. I'll tell you that. You need to know this. So um, if you ever get a question about patients suspected of having Gillian Barre and what would you ask them, that's on top of the list. That's on top of the list. Have you had a recent cold or stomach infection or any infection? You're going to ask them about a recent infection, okay? Now, let's look at the wrong choices. One, I just returned from a short trip to Japan. Um, 
traveling that has that has nothing to do with Guillain Barre. Three, I think one of the people I work with had this. It's not contagious. Four, I've been taking some herbs for more than a year. Herbs have uh, nothing to do with Guillain Barre syndrome either. Which assessment intervention should the nurse implement specifically for the diagnosis of Guillain Barre syndrome? One, assess deep tendon reflex. Two, complete a Glasgow Coma Scale. Three, check the Babinski reflex. Or four, take the client's vital signs. And guys, the correct answer is one, assess deep tendon reflexes. Did I not just tell you that Guillain Barre causes what? Paralysis of the muscle starting with the lower extremity. So does it make sense that you're going to check those deep tendon reflexes of those lower extremities? You want to see how far that the, the, the disorder has progressed. Now, I know some of you are tempted to choose number four vital signs. We take vital signs for all of our patients, but which one is specific to Gillian Barre? And it's going to be the deep tendon reflexes. When you choose that, you're showing the test writer that you understand that um, this disorder causes and, uh, uh, excuse me, attacks the muscles. It causes paralysis of the muscles. That's why you're going to check those muscles. Now, choice two, complete, uh, complete a Glasgow Coma Scale. Choice three, check the Babinski Reflex. This is a muscular disorder, not a neurological disorder. We're not worried about the patient having neurological deficits. So why would we do a Glasgow Coma Scale where we're trying to figure out the patient's level of consciousness? Why would we check for Babinski Reflex? We're not worried about their neurological condition. We're worried about the muscular condition. So two and three is wrong. And I already explained to you why four is the incorrect answer. You're going to choose number one. The healthcare provider scheduled a lumbar puncture for a client admitted to rule out Guillain-Barre syndrome. Which pre-procedure intervention has priority? One, keep the client NPO. Two, instruct the client to void. Three, place the client in lithotomy position. Or four, assess the client's pedal pulse. And guys, the correct answer is to instruct the client to void. So, um... Here is the correct answer. Um, here's the reason why. We're asking them, the client to void because we want to avoid, we're asking the client to void because we want to avoid the bladder being punctured. When the needle is inserted, if the patient has a full bladder, their bladder's full of urine, when the needle's being inserted, they might actually, the surgeon might accidentally puncture um, the bladder. So that's why we ask the patient to avoid. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, keep the client NPO. That's not necess necessary. Three, um, place the client in a lithotomy position. They're not going to be in a lithotomy position. They're going to be, um, uh, lying down flat. Um, excuse me. What's the next choice? Four, assess the client's pedal pulse. Um, assessing the client's pedal pulse, we do want to assess their pedal pulse, but here's the thing. We're checking the pedal pulse after, not before. We're checking it after. <laughs> so uh, the correct answer, guys, is to instruct the client to void. Which priority client problem should be included in the care plan for the client diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome. One, high risk for injury. Two, fear and anxiety. Three, altered nutrition. Four, ineffective breathing pattern. Okay, and the correct answer, guys, is uh, four, ineffective breathing pattern. First of all, that's going to be a priority because that's what's most life-threatening. Guys, go back to the question and they ask you which one's going to be a priority. And I know that some of you were tempted to choose high risk for injury. Yes, there are high risk for injury. This is very important. But it doesn't take priority over ineffective breathing pattern because remember what I told you. You have that muscle paralysis or muscle weakness. Okay? What happens when the muscles of the lungs are not working so the patient can't expand their lungs when they're breathing in and out, right? Perfusion goes down. That is life-threatening, so that's going to be our priority with the patient. The nurse caring for the client diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome writes a client problem impaired physical mobility. Which long-term goal should be written for this client? One, the client will have no skin irritation. Two, the client will have no muscle atrophy. Three, the client will perform a range of motion exercises. Or four, the client will turn every two hours while awake. 
Okay, guys, and the correct answer is to the client will have no muscle atrophy. Go back and look what the what the problem is. It says impaired physical um, mobility. What happens when you don't move? Those muscles start to shrivel up. So we want to prevent the muscles from shrivel, shriveling up, right? So even if they're... Um, they're immobile. That's why we're doing range of motions. We're doing those things in the bed with the patient. We don't want those muscles to shrivel up. We don't want muscle atrophy to happen. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, the client will have no skin irritation. That would be a goal for a client who had a problem with um, skin integrity. Okay. Choice three, the client will perform range of motion. Choice four, the client will turn every two hours those are nursing interventions, not goals. Those are nursing interventions. Which ocular or facial sign symptoms would the nurse expect to find when assessing the client diagnosed with myasthenia gravis? One, weakness and fatigue. Two, ptosis and diplo diplopia. Three, breathlessness and dyspnea. Four, weight loss and dehydration. And guys, the correct answer is ptosis and double vision. By the way, this is a famous nursing question, so you need to know this as well. Ptosis, drooping of the eyes, double vision, and blurred vision, guys. These are classic signs and symptoms of myasthenia gravis. 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 Classic. Okay, now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, weakness and fatigue. Um, if you go back to the question, the question's asking us, it says, which ocular or facial sign and symptom. Ocular eyeball or facial sign and symptom. That's what they're asking us. So weakness and fatigue, that's a muscular sign and symptom, not an ocular or facial sign and symptom. So that's wrong. Three, breathless and dyspnea. That is a respiratory sign and symptom, not an ocular or a facial sign and symptom. So that's wrong. Choice four, weight loss and dehydration. That's a nutritional sign and symptom, not an ocular or a facial sign and symptom. Therefore, number two is your correct answer. The client's being evaluated to rule out myasthenia gravis and being administered the Tensilon test. Which response to the test indicates the client has myasthenia gravis? One, the client has no apparent change in assessment data. Two, there's increased amplitude of electrical stimulation in the muscle. Three, the circulating acetylcholine receptor antibodies are decreased. Four, the client shows marked improvement of muscle strength. This is another famous nursing test question. Better make sure you know that concept. And guys, the correct answer is four, the client shows marked improvement in muscle strength. Here's the sad part, it's short lived. We see a marked improvement. They feel better right away. They're moving, but it only lasts for about five minutes. But once they get that, that tensile salon and then we see that marked improvement, we know, uh-oh, this is what the patient has. It's myasthenia gravis, okay? Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, there's no apparent change in assessment data. Well, we know that's wrong. We know that we see a marked improvement right away. It's short-lived, but we still see that improvement nonetheless. Um, choice two, there's increased amplitude of electrical stimulation. Actually, no, we're going to see decreased amplitude in myasthenia gravis. Three, the circulating acetylcholine receptor uh, antibodies are decreased. Actually, they're increased in myasthenia gravis. So the correct answer is four. Which surgical procedure should the nurse anticipate the client with myasthenia gravis undergoing to help prevent the signs and symptoms of this disease process? One, there's no surgical option. Two, a transphenoidal hypophysectomy. Three, a thymectomy. No, I pronounced that wrong. A thymomectomy. Did I? No. A thymectomy. I was right the first time. Or four, an adrenalectomy. Okay, guys. And the correct answer is the thymectomy. I was pointing here, but that's not where your thymectomy is. Your thymus is here. Sorry. So guys, um, your thymus, it's supposed to become inactive when you go through puberty. It's not supposed to work anymore. It's not supposed to be shooting out all of those antibodies. But what happens, that patient with myasthenia gravis, that thymus is still very active. So 
The thought process behind the thymectomy is that we get rid of that thymus, we severely decrease the number of antibodies that are being produced and shooting around in the body, therefore we decrease those signs and symptoms, it's kind of like a domino effect, okay? So that's why thymectomy is the correct answer. Now let's look at our an other answer choices. One, there's no surgical option. Well, we know that's wrong. I just told you why they do the thymectomy. Two, transphenoidal hypophysectomy. We do that for patients who has you know, pituitary issues like tumors. Uh, choice four, adrenalectomy, that's done for patients with what? Cushings, right? They're shooting out too much mineral corticosteroids, glucocorticosteroids, um, I'm missing one, and, and, and androgen hormones. So uh, adrenalectomy is wrong as well. The correct answer is three, thymectomy. The client diagnosed with myasthenia gravis is being discharged home. Which intervention has priority when teaching the client significant others? One, discuss ways to help prevent choking. Two, explain how to care for the client on a ventilator. Three, teach how to perform passive range of motion exercises. Or four, demonstrate how to care for the client's feeding tube. And guys, the correct answer is one, discuss how to prevent choking episodes. Remember guys, I'm sorry, um, Aspiration is life-threatening in these patients because they don't have the accessory muscles. They don't have those muscles to actually help them cough up um, any excess uh, uh, mucus or whatever it is. They don't have it, so they can actually die. Now, let's look at our other choices. Two, explain how to care for a client on a ventilator. Um, that client's on a vent. They're going to be in the ICU. It's in very very limited amount of cases that patients go home on vents. They just don't, okay? So it's not gonna be number two. And if the patient does go on home on the vent, they're gonna have a home health nurse that you know, knows how to care for patients on vents. It's not gonna be a family. Choice three, teach them how to perform a range of motion exercises. Um, that's not a priority as airway is, so teaching them how to prevent um, choking. Or in choice four, demonstrate how to care for feeding tube. These patients usually don't have a feeding tube. And even if they did, it still wouldn't be a priority. Airway, protecting that airway is a priority and number one is the correct answer. All right, guys, and we are down to our last question. To which collaborative healthcare team member should the nurse refer the client in the late stages of myasthenia gravis? One, occupational therapy. Two, recreational therapy. Three, vocational therapist. Or four, speech therapist. And guys, by far the most important referral is going to be for the speech therapist. Why? What is the speech therapist uh, responsible for? The swallow study, the swallow eval. We want to make sure that that patient's safe for PO, liquids, foods, anything by mouth because uh, this patient is at risk for aspiration. We don't want that to happen because it's life-threatening to the patient. So by far, that's going to be the priority, the speech therapist. Guys, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope it kind of cleared up your myasthenia gravis versus your Guillain-Barre versus your multiple sclerosis. I, I hope it kind of cleared that up for you. If there's anything I haven't covered that you'd like to see me cover, go ahead, go, that you would like to see me cover, go ahead and leave a comment below. Let me know what you th thought about this video. And guys, please don't forget, my podcasts are available. You can also catch my podcast on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. My audio lessons are available. You can catch those on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And I'm also now on TikTok and Instagram. My handle is Nexus Nursing. Thank you so much for spending this time with this video, spending so much time watching me make this video. If you haven't done so already, guys, please help support this channel by liking and subscribing below and sharing my content with your friends. Thank you so much. And I'll see you on the next, well, you'll be seeing me on the next video.